Please be seated. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. I should say gentleman. Um, while you're getting settled in, I'm going to ask my morning questions. If your answer is yes to any of the questions, please raise your hand. During the overnight recess, did any of you have any conversations amongst yourselves or with anybody else about the case? No hands are being raised. Did any of you read or listen to any radio, television, newspaper reports about the case? No hands are being raised. Did any of you use an electronic device to get on the internet to do any independent research about the case, people, places, things, terminology? No hands are being raised. And finally, did any of you read or create any emails, text messages, Twitters, tweets, blogs, or social networking pages about the case? No hands are being raised. Thank you very much. Ms. Gentel, good morning. I'm going to remind you that you're still under oath. When you took your oath yesterday, it remains in effect. Mr. West, you may proceed. Does this need to be here? Can you please here? I'm sorry, if we could just, just need a little space. Good morning. Yesterday, we were talking about an interview that you gave to Mr. Crump over the telephone. Yes. And we had focused on a part of that interview where you were telling Mr. Crump what Trayvon Martin said that you heard, why are you following me? is what you said that he said, correct? Yes. And that the first thing that you told Mr. Crump that you heard from Mr. Zimmerman was, what are you talking about? Remember saying that yesterday? Yes. And then that changed to, what are you doing around here? Your Honor, I'm going to object this to uh, Rephrase this to the word changed. Pardon me? Rephrase your question, not the objections to the word changed. The first time you answered the question, what did you hear? You said that the, the other man, Mr. Zimmerman said, what, um, what are you talking about? Remember that being your answer? I don't remember, <coughs> yes. I don't remember, but yes. You saw that on the deposition and you agreed that's what you'd said. Yes. And then when asked again, or when you were talking about that same thing again, instead of saying, what are you talking about? It became what you doing around here, correct? Yes. And then at your deposition, when I took your deposition, you said in the letter that you wrote. Well, I want to object again as to um, restating what occurred yesterday as opposed to asking a question. Okay, um, it's a preliminary question. I'll allow it from an overnight recess, it, just to set where we are. In your in your deposition, you said, in fact, that in the letter that you wrote to Sabrina Fulton, you said what you doing around here was what you attributed to Mr. Zimmerman. Yes. At your deposition is we, when we learned for the first time that you had written a letter, correct? Yes. You had never said that in any of your other statements. No. The letter was the one that you and your friend um, Put together the one that you gave to Miss Fulton on March 19th. Yes. And you had never mentioned that to anyone prior to you mentioning it to us in Miami in March of this year. It was a personal letter for her. Of course, I know that's what you said. You didn't even tell the prosecutor about it? No. You met with the prosecutor though in Jacksonville in early August, correct? Yes. And that's when you told him, oh, I didn't go to the hospital. I, I lied about that. Yes. But you didn't tell him you'd written the letter? No. May I have the letter, please? I, I can look real quick. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
marked as defendant CC for identification. Let me approach you for a moment and show you this letter. It's a copy, of course. Will you take a look at it? Judge, I have the intent to introduce it. I have no objection to it being introduced to evidence. Are you seeking to have it introduced? Yes. Okay. Um, it'll come into evidence as defendant's next. I, I don't. 17. Thank you. Should we mark it now? You can have it. So. Okay. Oh, Ms. Gentile, let me show you the letter. It's now marked as Defendant's Exhibit 17. And let me then ask you a few questions uh, about that. Uh, I'm going to object to this witness the letter. Uh, there's a reason why, and I, I don't want to make a speaking objection, but. Okay, well, please approach. Ms. Gentile, would you take a look at that copy of the letter and let me ask you a couple of questions about it. Do you recognize that letter as being one that you said earlier was prepared to be given to Ms. Fulton? Yes. And that letter was prepared with the assistance of a friend of yours named Francine Sir? Yes. And you and uh, Ms. Serve talked about what you wanted to be in the letter, and then she helped write it in a way that was legible, correct? Yes. But the contents of the letter are yours. Yes. Are you able to read that copy well enough that you can tell us if it's in fact the same letter? No. Are you unable to read that at all? Some of them, I do not. Can you read any of the words on it? I don't understand. Um, curses. I don't read curses. Did you sign it at the bottom? Yes. What name did you use? Dami Eugene. I'm sorry. Dami Eugene. Diamond Eugene. Are you saying that? Uh, I, I have no objection. This thing keeps flashing right here on the computer. I wonder if we can do without, something. I don't know without putting the screen up, can we take the flashing off? That's your name that you signed at the bottom? Yes. But it's not actually your name? No. That's a name that you made up? My, that's my nickname. But your last name isn't Eugene. That's my mother. Right, last so name. you signed it Diamond Eugene so as not to use your real name? Yes. Okay. I'll read the letter then. Can you not read this here? Yes. What does that say? March the 19th, 2012. And can you read this at the bottom? Thank you. And then you signed your name? Yes. And you can't read any of the words here? Not all of them. But you can read typewritten words, just not cursive? Yeah. Subject to correction by the state, the letter reads as follows. I was on the phone when Trayvon decided to go to the corner store. It started to rain, so he decided to walk through another complex because it was raining too hard. He started walking, then noticed someone was following him. Then he decided to find a shortcut. There's, there's an objection here. Should be then, you stated he. Would you like to read it? I don't mind, but I don't mind you reading. I just, I think. Okay, it, direct your comments to me, please. Go ahead and read and correct um, the sentence. I'll start it. Okay. 
I should take the podium home. Huh? <coughs> I was on the phone when Trayvon decided to go to the corner store. It started to rain, so he decided to walk through another complex because it was raining too hard. He started walking then, noticed, he started walking then noticed someone was following him. So that, I'll read that again. It was, I was on the phone when Trayvon decided to go to the corner store. It started to rain, so he decided to walk through another complex because it was raining too hard. He started walking, then noticed someone was following him. Then he decided to find a shortcut because the man wouldn't follow him. Then he said the man didn't follow him again. Then he looked back and saw the man again. The man started getting closer. Then Trayvon turned around and said, why are you following me? Then I heard him fall. Then the phone hung up. I called back and text, no response. In my mind, I thought it was just a fight. Then I found out this tragic story. Thank you, Diamond Eugene. Is that the letter that you and Ms. Serve prepared to give to Sabrina Fulton? Yes. And contrary to what you said at the deposition, this letter does not in fact contain any response that the person gave to Trayvon Martin when he said, why are you following me? Yes. Further, you say that you thought this was just a fight. Yes. This was the letter that you gave to Ms. Fulton on the same day that you talked with her and told her basically what happened. Yes. And you told her, I take it, then the same thing that you said here, or did you tell her more? Tell her more. Did you tell her that the, the man that Trayvon said, why are you following me to, responded in some way? Yes. And what did you tell her that he said? Repeat your question again. Mm -hmm. Did you tell Ms. Fulton what the man said when Trayvon Martin said, why are you following me? Did you say to Ms. Fulton what the man said in response? Yes. And what did you tell her? What are you doing around here? I'm sorry. What are you doing around here? So that's what you told Ms. Fulton? Yes, in the car, yes. And you're sure you actually had a conversation with Ms. Fulton? Not for that long. Not for that long. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I'm not challenging that, but you're saying that you had a conversation about the, the, the facts of the case, if you will. Yes. Right? And those facts including, included you saying that Mr. Zimmerman said, what are you doing around here? Yes. You do acknowledge, though, the first time that you were uh, asked that question in your interview with Mr. Crump later that day, your response was that Mr. Zimmerman said, what are you talking about? Yes. Are you sure those were the words that Trayvon Martin said, or could you have been sort of trying to figure out what was said, and that's what you came up with? I'm sure. Which are you sure about, that he said, why are you what are you talking me? about, or why are you following me? Why are you following me, bro? But why are you following me? What Trayvon said, why are you following me for? But you first said, in response to that question, what are you talking about, was the answer. I cannot hear you, sir. I cannot hear you, sir. 
Your testimony today is what you heard on the phone the man say that uh, George Zimmerman was, what are you doing around here? Yes. And in the first statement that you made to Mr. Crump in his interview of you, you said what Mr. Zimmerman's response was, was, what are you talking about? Yes. It was in the interview with Mr. Crump that you said you thought this was a racial thing. He had asked me if it, if it was a racial thing. What did he say? Do you think this, situ um, this situation was a racial thing? And I had Mr. Crump asked you that on the recording? Yes. Have you had a chance to look at the transcript? or listen to the recording? Did you ever hear him say that on the recording? There are all sorts of the compound yeah, questions. Yeah, you need to break your question up. Sure. Um, do you remember him saying that specifically to you during that phone interview? Yeah. Have you ever seen a transcript of the recording or ever listened to the recording to know whether or not, in fact, it's there? Yes. And is it there? No. But your comment is that you think it's a racial thing. Yes. So in other words, Mr. Crump didn't record that part of the conversation where he asked you if you thought it was a racial thing, but only recorded your answer when you said you think it's a racial thing. Objection as to what Mr. Crump did or did not do. Sustained. She can't testify what he, what he thought. She can only testify as to what she heard. Your question is, did Mr. Crump ever do that? If she's not around him, there's no way for her to know if he did that when she's not there. She could testify as to what she heard. Yes, what I'm trying to, what I'm focusing in on is this. You believe that Mr. Crump asked you in that recorded interview whether you thought it was a racial thing. Yes. Oh, sure. And then when you've had a chance to listen to the recording or look at the transcript, you can't find his question anywhere in it. No. You have had a chance, though, to review your um, transcripts or prior statements, haven't you? Yes. So you decided it was a racial thing because someone told you it was a racial thing or you came up with this on your own or why did you conclude that this was a racial thing? How the situation happened. How the situation happened. How about what was being said on the news? On the news? Mm -hmm. that, um, the interview between me and Crump happened, um, happened before the news even know about it. You have a nationwide rule about the situation. So your, your belief is that you had the interview with Mr. Crump before then, this story was in the news about George Zimmerman racially profiling and murdering Trayvon Martin. Yeah. <coughs> You'd never heard that before. I told you I don't watch the news. Well, how about when you talked with Tracy Martin? Did he say, would you please come forward? Because we are saying this is a racially motivated murder. No. He just asked me, can, he talk, can I talk to his attorney? How about when you talked to Ms. Fulton? Did she say, would you please come forward and talk to our attorney and record it because we think this is a racially charged no. event? No. And you didn't have any information from the news that this was a racially charged event? No, I had to go and watch the news. Okay. Are you okay this morning? Yeah. You seem so different than yesterday. I'm just checking. Did someone Is that talk a with you? Yes. Did someone talk with you last night about your demeanor in court yesterday? No, I went to sleep. So your testimony is that 
you hadn't heard anything on the news about this being a racially charged incident. I was repeating the answers. Sustained. Attorney, may we approach, please? No. You didn't know anything about this case on the news following the shooting on February 26th prior to your interview with Mr. Crump on March 19th. No, sir. I had, I had told you that yesterday. Mm -hmm. I don't watch the news. And no one else told you that no, there sir. was a lot of noise about this being a racially charged event. No, sir. So when you asked, answered Mr. Crump's question, that's not on the recording, what you think about it being a racially charged event, you said, yes, it was. Yes, sir. And what did you base your answer that you thought it was a racial thing? What information did you base that on? Because how the situation happened. Tell me, what is it about this event specifically that convinced you it was racially based? Trayvon was being followed. And it was around 7, and it's not that late. And it's in the rain. Like, come on now. It is in the rain. It's in the rain. Around it's raining. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's raining. Yes. And he's out by himself walking around. Yes. And I'm not walking around, just standing under a shade when it's raining. Well, you don't really know what he was actually doing, do you? Under a shade, yes. You don't actually know that, do you? I know when he, I asked where he at. He told me he's under a shade right. in the area. So what you know about this whole event is what Mr. Martin told you and what you interpreted it to me. Jackson, are you mad at him? That's the question. Overruled. Repeat your question. Again. Sure. That you didn't see anything, you weren't there. Uh, no. You still don't know where the mail thing is or where any of the streets are or where on the map um, Trayvon was, Martin was staying, correct? No. You don't know how far the man was from him at any given point in time. He wasn't that far because he turned around and told me that the man was just is watching him. Right. So, my, my, before I lose track here, everything that you've told us is based upon whatever Trayvon Martin told you that you can remember. Yes. And then how, what you interpreted it to mean. Yes. So when you say it's a racial event, yes. what did he tell you that made you think it was a racial event? Somebody just watching him and then he described the person, the person that was watching him and following him and that was kind of strange that a person keep watching you and following you. So he said- like he being stalked. Like he's being stalked from the person, that person. What makes that racial? That made that would it make that racial. It was made that racial. What's moment. one one thing about what Trayvon Martin told you that made you think this was racial? Describing the person. Pardon me. Describing the person. I, I just didn't. Describing I, the person that was watching him and following him. I sir. See. Describing the person is what made you think it was racial? Yes. And that's because you described him as a creepy ass cracker? Yes. So it was racial, but it was because Trayvon Martin put race in this. No. You don't think that's a racial comment? No. You don't think that creepy ass cracker is a racial comment? <clears throat> No. Well, you didn't mention it in your letter, correct? 
That's just a per that's just a personal letter to the mama. Right. You didn't tell Miss That's just a personal letter to the mother. You didn't tell Miss Fulton that the man that was following him was a creepy ass cracker, did you? No. You didn't tell Mr. Crump in the recorded interview that Trayvon Martin described George Zimmerman as a creepy ass cracker. No. And when you met with Mr. Della Rionda for the first time on April 2nd, 2012, you never told him in your interview that Trayvon Martin said a creepy ass cracker was following him. No, I did say creepy, sir. Yes, I agree. You did say creepy. Yes. So the reason you didn't say that, though, was because you didn't think it was relevant? Nobody asked me. When you come ask me what exactly that Trayvon said that night about the person that was following him and watching him. That's what you asked me when I met up with you. So never before I met with you in March did you ever tell anyone exactly what you heard Trayvon Martin say? Correct? About the person, describing the person? Yes, in any of the interviews where you were asked what was said, what happened next. What was said, did, yes, I did. Well, by describing him, no, I did not. I you just said, said creepy. No, some I'm, dudes following. One, one at a time, because the court reporter has to take down both voices, if you'll allow her to please finish her answer. Are you finished with your answer? Yes. Okay, you may ask your next question. Of course you wouldn't say it to Sabrina Fulton because it was offensive, correct? Yes, that was disrespectful. Pardon that me? was disrespectful. Of course it was, it yes. Me. You may not consider it a racial comment, but it's no. certainly offensive, isn't it? No. You don't think calling someone a creepy ass cracker is offensive? No. So. But you specifically chose not to tell Ms. Fulton that's what Trayvon Martin said. No. Because you thought it would hurt her feelings, didn't you? No. You didn't think she, that would bother her if you said that her son described the man that was following him in a car on the phone I didn't think was that a was creepy important. ass cracker. I did not think that was important. Not important enough to put in the letter. No. And not important enough to tell her. Can we move on to another topic? Just to be clear then, you didn't include that in the letter and you didn't include it in the conversation you had on March 19th with Ms. Fulton? No. And when you were interviewed by uh, Mr. Crump in later that day, you didn't say it? No. And then you were interviewed in, but you did say to Mr. Crump that you thought the event itself was a racial thing? Yes. He had asked me and I said yes. And I was asking you then, what made you think that? And then you were saying, just because of the description, is that what you're saying? Yes. The description being there was a man on the phone in a car watching him. Yes. And you and met, you, him. pardon me? And follow him. Right. So you took that to be racial? Yes. Without any additional information? No. On April 2nd, on April 2nd, you had an opportunity to meet with the prosecutor, correct? Yes. Up until that point, you had never spoken with law enforcement. No. Even following your interview with, um, with Mr. Crump, 
you didn't then go to the police? No. Even after hearing part of your interview on national television or hearing about it, you didn't go to the police? No. Parents, the police did not know her. Would you speak By up? the parents, the parents did not know my real name. They only knew me as Diamond. But they had your phone number, right? Yes. Because there were texts and phone calls. Between who? You and Ms. Fulton? No. She sent you a text? That was March the 19th. That's what I'm talking about? Yes. After March 19th, you didn't go to law enforcement and law enforcement never contacted you, correct? Correct. But Ms. Fulton had your phone number? Yes. So she could have given that to the police? Yes. Um, she could have given it to the Sanford Police Department? Couldn't she? Yeah. Uh, objectives to what somebody else could have or not done. Sustained. She didn't have your real name because you'd lied about that, but she did have um, your phone number. Yes. And in between March 19th and April 2nd, nobody from poli the police department called you. I, I can't recall, but no, because my phone was... I can't recall. I can't recall. My phone was off. I shut it off. Did you shut your phone off, are you saying, between... March 19th? No, I sh shut it off. It was a lot of phone calls. I'm sorry. It was, was a lot it, of phone was calls. Was it disconnected? No. I shut it off. You turned it off? I turned it off. How long did you leave your phone off? Be three. In a day, it would be three hours or four hours. Well, when you turned it back on, you would get voicemails, wouldn't you? Yes. You get any text messages? <clears throat> I ain't get no text message. But you would if someone had sent you one after you turn the phone on. You get your text messages. Yes. And when you turned your phone back on between March nineteenth and April second, there weren't any text messages from Miss Fulton telling you to please go to the police. No. Or any messages from law enforcement saying, would you please By contact? By watching the television, I thought the police was already in the case. Say that again. By me watching television, I thought the police already knew about the case. So when you, I didn't think you watched television, I'm sorry. That was before mm -hmm. March the 19th, or March the 20th. That's when I started watching the television. That's when my voice became on television. That's when I started paying attention to the news. So on March 20th, when you were, when they had the press conference about you. No, is I when didn't you see the press conference. They only showed half it, say Trayvon, Trayvon Martin was on the phone with a, the final moments. Did, the news then you're talking about that had your voice on it was the recording made by ABC News? Yes, I think. Did you talk with somebody from ABC News separately from your interview with Mr. Crum? Yes. And when and where was that, please? I don't remember, but it was by phone. I don't remember that. I don't remember, it was by phone. And when, approximately, after March 19th was the day that you were interviewed, when did you, after that, talk with the reporter from ABC News? I don't remember. Roughly? Before, before I even talked to the state attorney. Sometime between March 19th, after, when you gave your interview to Mr. Crumb, Yes. And you didn't know you were being recorded then by ABC, correct? No. But after that, though, you had a separate phone interview with ABC? Yes. Was it the next day, the day after, a week later? Any idea? No. And who was it that you talked with? I 
I'm not his name. Did he know your name? He didn't know my real name. He what? Did you give him a name? He said to me. I, I, I can't hear the witness. Would the court could ask you, the witness? Could you speak up a little bit, please? He had told me um, he had got my number. Well, she had got my number <coughs> from the ABC reporter. She had texted me saying she wanted to know about Trayvon, what kind of person he was. And I have a talk with her boss, I think, about Trayvon, what kind of person he was. So you got a text from somebody that want, where the media wanted to talk with you further? It was an ABC woman. Right. She's, it was an ABC woman. And then you gave... She, she okay. had a call, she texted. And then you agreed to have a separate recorded interview? Yes. And do you know the person that interviewed you? No. Did you tell them the name Diamond Eugene? I just told him. He had asked me how. Do he want me to call me? Yeah. I, yeah. He had asked me how he want me to say in the media. I said Dee Dee. That's when Dee Dee started popping up. So you used the nickname Dee Dee to yeah. identify yourself? Yeah. Did you tell that person how old you were? No, he didn't ask me that. Did he ask, he didn't ask you the, your real name? No. So that was sometime after March 19th, but before April 2nd, correct? Yes. And did you have any other interviews with anybody between March, between the ABC interview and April 2nd? No. On April 2nd, you were interviewed by Mr. Della Rionda, correct? Yes, sir. And there were other agents there with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement? Yes, sir. So this was your first interview with law enforcement? Yes, sir. When you interviewed with Mr. Crump, you were rushed, you didn't take it seriously, and you weren't under oath, correct? Yes, sir. But on April 2nd, you were well, under oath? Yes, sir. And you were being interviewed by the police? Yes, sir. And it was recorded? Yes, sir. From the state attorney's office, now at this point, the Jacksonville State Attorney's Office was involved in the case as opposed to the Seminole County State Attorney's Office, correct? Yes, sir. So Mr. Delarionda said, I'm from Jacksonville, I'm down here to interview you, and introduced you to the FDLE agents that were present and his um, State Attorney Investigator, Mr. Osteen. Yes, sir. And you already had met the other people in the room? What other people? Well, tell me who else was in the room with you when Mr. Della Rionda was conducting the first interview by law enforcement? Trayvon's mother. Trayvon's mother, Sabrina Fulton, correct? Yes. Was in the room with you yes. when Mr. Della Rionda was asking you questions for the first law enforcement interview? Yes, sir. And where was she in the room? Beside me. So she's sitting right beside you as Mr. Della Rionda is asking you questions as his office has been assigned to investigate this alleged murder case. The objection? Our objection is he keeps repeating the answers that the witness previously gave as opposed to asking other questions, being repetitive, and also the nature of the questions. Sustained. Um, may I have a little latitude on cross-examination, well, please? Well, you're, you're be giving a lot of latitude as you're entitled to. The objection is because you repeat the answer of the last question in your new question. And I think that you're required to just ask a new question. If you want to ask another question that gives an answer, you may do so. But the objections to continuing to repeat the answer 
in your new questions. So I apologize. My efforts to be precise so that the witness knows exactly what we're talking about, but I will try to do it a little differently. Thank you. Right beside you during this interview was Trayvon Martin's mother, Sabrina Fulton, correct? Yes, sir. Mr. Martin was also there, but not in the room, correct? No, sir. He left before I even stepped inside the living room. He left the living room, in other words? Yes, sir. You don't know that he left the residence, though, do you? No, sir. He may have still been there, but just not in the room with you. Yes, sir. Also in the room was one or more um, Martin family attorneys, correct? Yes, sir. Who were they? I don't know their names, sir. Do you know Natalie Jackson? Yes, sir. Was she there? On top of the stairs, sir. I'm sorry? On top of the stairs. So you knew she was there and present, correct? Yes, sir. Was Mr. Crump present? No, he left before I even stepped inside the house. But you saw him that night? Not that night. That afternoon. When you say that afternoon, uh, tell me about that. I'm sorry, maybe I misspoke. The interview itself took place in the early evening, didn't it? Yes, sir. So you met with Mr. Crump earlier that day? No, sir. Tell me then what you mean, that you saw him. When he went to uh, one of the um, <coughs> detectives and Ms. Sabrina and... I'm sorry, the detective now. Ms. Sabrina and Crump, he had joined in. He had came with them to have pick me up from my friend residence so I could go back there to have an um, interview with the state. That's when I met Carl. That's my first time meeting Carl. The other time it was only on the phone when yes. you talked with when him? when I interviewed, yes. And this day on April 2nd, 2012, you met him because he was one of the people that went to your friend's house to pick you up? Yes. To bring you to Miss Fulton's house, correct? Yes. This interview actually took place at Sabrina Fulton's home in her living room, correct? Yes, sir. So, Mr. Crump came to your friend's home to pick you up along with whom? I was outside already. Okay. I met him. But of your friend's house? Yes, sir. So, Mr. Crump came to get you, correct? Not come and get me. He was in another car. And to I was in Two cars yeah, came together. Yeah, with detectives and stuff. So that afternoon, Mr. Crump was in one of the cars that was dispatched to go pick you up. Yes, sir. And you were in the front yard of your friend's house. Yes, sir. And law enforcement also was involved in picking you up? Yes, sir. You don't know why then law enforcement would permit Mr. Crump to come with them? Um, That's an argumentative beyond the witness's knowledge. Sustained. That's beyond her knowledge. I'm asking whether she knew or not, and she said no. If the court would give me a little leeway on this. Ask your next question. Uh -huh. do, you have, do you know why law enforcement allowed Mr. Crump to come with them to pick you up? No, sir. Who else was there? Was Miss Fulton with them? Yes, sir. Do you know why law enforcement allowed Miss Fulton to be there? Because she's the only no, she's the only person who knew where my friend lived. At. She lived by my friend area. Miss Fulton lives near where your friend lives. Yes, sir. But law enforcement had your phone number. They could have just called and asked you where you were. Correct. Um. Yes, sir. Mr. Crump had your phone number. He could have called and asked where you were. On it. Pardon me? I don't know if Crump had my number. I don't know. I did not know. I do not know if Crump had my number. In the interview he took of you on March 19th, didn't he say, we're having trouble with this phone, let me call you back? 
Okay, he had my number then. From a 904 number. And he called you back on your phone. Yes, sir. Ms. Gentile, I'm not saying you did anything wrong, so please don't take it that way. I'm trying to understand the I, dynamics of this, though. I know I did not wrong, so. No, sir. I know, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, if I'm harsh in my tone, it's not because I'm suggesting you did anything wrong here. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to understand what the overall context of this first law enforcement interview was. So the people that came to pick you up included law enforcement, but it also included Ben Crump and Judge, Sabrina. Again, it's repeating the answer that the witness already gave. Yeah. Ask, ask the please, question. Judge. Just, just ask the question, who was there? I would be, I'd like permission to ask leading questions of this witness on cross-examination one step at a time. And I'm asking that you do it one step at a time. My question is this, just to be clear as to who was present. Law enforcement, FDLE agents were present. Yes. Ben Crump was present. Sabrina Fulton was present in these two vehicles that came to pick you up on the afternoon of April 2nd, 2012. Yes, sir. And was Mr. Delarionda present? I don't remember him. I, I was in the back of the car. I do you know of anybody else being present? I do remember a tall dude. I do remember. A tall person. Did you ever see him again later that evening? Yes, sir. Was he in the room? Yes, sir. You don't recall his name, though? T.C. T.C. Do you know that person to be an investigator with Mr. Delarionda's office? Yes, sir. Was there anybody else? In the car? Either of the cars. I don't know who was in the other car, but I did know who was in the car. <coughs> I'm, I can't hear you, ma'am. Did you speak on the I do not know who was in the other car, but I do know who was in the car I was in. Let's start there then. Who was in the car with you? TC. And I think he was in the car. Did I? I think he was in the car. Mr. Delarionda? Yeah, I did say a, a ball do no offense. And, um, okay, we have a John who didn't hear the answer. Could you please speak up? If you could face the microphone a little bit better. TC. That's the wrong microphone. Speak to me. That's what they can do. Yes. TC the front the front of the car was TC ball headed dude this he, guy yeah sorry man I didn't know you and Sabrina and me and you went from your friend's house to Miss Fulton's house yes sir and the people that you've already identified so far were in the room with you when the interview take, took place? Yes, sir. Anybody else? Any other family members? No, sir. Any other lawyers? Another, another lawyer from the Martin family? Right. Remember a kind big, of a, a big guy? A big guy, yes, sir. Do you know his name? No, sir. Would you know it if I said it? <coughs> No. So when the interview began in Ms. Fulton's living room, you were seated next to Ms. Fulton and were the other people that you've identified other than Tracy Martin in the room then or close by? Yes, sir. Was in the um, living room. I take it you knew that Ms. Fulton would be hearing exactly what you said because you were sitting next to her. Yes, sir. 
and you certainly didn't want to say anything that you thought would hurt her feelings or make her grief even worse. Yes, sir. So because of that, you were very sensitive to Ms. Fulton's feelings when you answered Mr. Delariandis questions. Yes, sir. And that is why, for example, that you cleaned up some of the language that Trayvon Martin used. Yes, sir. You wanted to be helpful because you wanted to help the prosecutor arrest George Zimmerman. I never thought I was a witness, a serious witness around that time. At that point, being interviewed by law enforcement under oath, you still hadn't um, concluded that you would be a witness in the case? Not an important witness. Not an important witness. No. Because of that, did that also shape some of the things you said and why you said them? Yes. So, yes? Yes, sir. For other reasons, you didn't want to hurt Ms. Fulton's feelings and that you really didn't think you were going to be an important witness in the case? No, sir. Is that why when Mr. Della Rionda wanted to know what Trayvon Martin said, you said this man's watching me rather than what he actually said? Yes, sir. You thought that would be offensive to Ms. Fulton and to the other people in the room? Yes, Ms. Fulton. Just Ms. Fulton? Yes, sir. So, when you answered the questions that Mr. Della Rionda asked you about what was said <coughs> by whom, you were concerned about how Ms. Fulton would feel or react if you actually spoke the accurate words or the, the, the accurate truth. Jason, the compound question is complicated. <clears throat> Did you understand? My, I'm sorry. Did you Did understand, you understand my question? the question? Yes, ma'am. Okay, could you answer it? No, sir. Let me see if I can say it better then. When Mr. Della Rionda was asking questions about what happened and who said what, you were making it sound different than it actually was to, to keep from hurting Ms. Fulton's feelings. Not all of them, sir. I'm sorry. Not all of them, sir. Not all of the answers, correct? Yes, ma'am. But some of the answers. Yes, sir. Some of the um, some of the answers about language, for example. Yes, that's the only. Yes. That's the only thing that I change around. Yes, I did not that's say the that, I that I did not say. So the only thing that you didn't say that was accurate <clears throat> was the language that Trayvon Martin used? Yes, sir. I didn't think it was that important. He did not ask me what was Trayvon. He did not ask me if Trayvon was describing the man. He just told me I didn't think it was that important at all. He had asked me well, how Trayvon think the man looked. Yeah. I said creepy. Don't no, think I say it's creepy. I'm not going to say it in front of the whole world, in front of people. You were going to say what Trayvon Martin actually said in front of his mother. Yeah, that's disrespectful. Of course, of course. No one's arguing with you about that. But that's the decision that you made was basically to clean it up. Yes, sir. You knew she was grieving. She had just lost a son. You were very sensitive to that, correct? Yes, sir. In fact, 
as you were explaining what happened and answering Mr. Delariandis' questions with Ms. Fulton sitting there right beside you, she was crying, wasn't she? She was not crying, just tearing a little up about when I start telling what happened that night. Again, it's so hard to hear, but did you say that she meant she wasn't crying, but she was tearing up? Yeah, just tearing up. Tears coming out of her eyes. Yeah. Do you associate that with pain and grief and suffering? Of course. You also, though, told Mr. De La Rianda under oath that you'd gone to the hospital. Correct? He had asked me, did I want to go to the hospital? I said, yeah. So you, I know that you had said that earlier to Mr. Crump and to Ms. Fulton to ex give a, a, a plausible explanation to them for why you didn't go to the memorial service or the wake. Is that right? Yes, sir. And then when Mr. De La Rianda asked you about it again, you gave the same answer. Yes, sir. But you knew that was a lie. Yes, sir. Again, you lied because you wanted to give a plausible answer to Ms. Fulton as to why you didn't go to the wake. Yes, sir. But on the April 2nd interview, you were in fact under oath. Yes, sir. And you knew that. Yes, sir. And you made a decision then because of how difficult the situation you had just been put in, you decided to lie about going to the hospital rather than say something that might be painful. Yes, sir. In the interview, in, in the first conversation with Ms. Fulton on March 19th and in the letter on March 19th, at no time did you mention that you heard Trayvon Martin say, a little get off, get off. Correct? Yes, sir. Is that yes, you did not say that? Yes, sir. Let me put your question again. In the, inter in the meeting you had, the conversation you had with Ms. Fulton on March 19th, before you did the interview later, and in the written statement that you and Ms. Serve prepared for Ms. Fulton, the personal statement, uh, in neither of those instances did you say that you heard Trayvon Martin say, as you said later, a little get off, get off, correct? Yes, sir. And that's because you didn't think that was important at that point? That's Carl and Ms. Fulton did not ask me. Carl and Ms. Um, Ms. Fulton did not ask me about when um, the, um, the fight started in the grass. They did not ask me about that. He asked me about that. So when you decided what part of what you knew to tell Miss Fulton, you decided not to tell her that part. She didn't ask me. Well, I'm not sure that that was her answer, so you need to, to re-ask the question. I believe she said they never asked her that. All right, now I'm asking about this witness's thinking. So when you decided what part of the information that you had about the events on the evening of February 26th, you decided in what to tell Ms. Fulton not to tell her that you'd heard a little get off, get off from Trayvon Martin. Judge, in compound question, argumentative and mischaracterizing what this witness has previously said. Okay, as far as compound, do you understand the question? No, no ma'am. 
Pardon? No, ma'am. Okay, you need to break it down then. She says she doesn't understand. Okay. On March 19th, yes, you had a meeting with Ms. Fulton yes, sir. out in front of her home. Yes, sir. You had already written the letter with Ms. Serve to give to her. Yes, sir. When you wrote the letter about what happened on the evening of February 26th and decided what to put in it, you made the decision not to include that you heard Trayvon Martin say a little get off, get off. Yes, sir. And then when you went to Ms. Fulton's house to talk with her and she was so anxious to know what happened. That I did she not needed. go inside her house, sir. I know that, you're out front. <clears throat> yes, sir. When you went to Ms. Fulton's house with the letter in hand to talk with her and she so desperately wanted to know what had happened, you, among the things that you chose to tell her, decided not to tell her that you'd heard her son say a little get off, get off on the phone. Yes, sir. And you're saying that's because she didn't specifically ask you? No, sir. Could you explain your thinking? I am going to be there, sir. Of all the things that you decided were important to tell her, to write in she the letter not, and to... She did not ask me for examples. She did not ask me for, me for examples. Definition. Not ask me for no examples. examples. Reason. None of that. The state asked me that. Court did not ask me that either. So, no, oh, sir. Well, how would they know to ask you um, if you didn't tell them what you knew? Judge, now she's wanting, she's wanting the witness now to get in my mind as to why I asked something or not. Okay, to the extent of her explaining why or why not the state did something I'm going to sustain. Whether or not someone specifically asked you, you made the decision not to volunteer that information. I didn't think it was important. I was going to be asked about the situation. I, was not, I did not think it was important, so I was not being asked for that situation. Um, that part, so it didn't matter. He had asked me that. The state had asked me that. All right, we'll talk about that in a little more detail in a minute, but let's, let's progress now to the interview that you gave to Mr. Crump uh, on the phone on March 19th, later the same day. You acknowledge that nowhere in that, what was it, about 30 minutes altogether? You yeah, asked me? The interview. I don't remember. But nowhere during that interview did you say, in response to any question, specific or general, that you'd heard Trayvon Martin say a little get off, get off. He did not ask me when the fight happened. I had told him the phone had just shut off. He didn't ask me, did you hear when there was fighting going on? Did you hear something was going on between the fight? No, he did not ask me that. The state asked me that, sir. Well, what you told Mr. Crump was that you heard Trayvon Martin say, why are you following me? And then you heard Mr. Zimmerman say either, what are you talking about or what are you doing around here? And then you heard something that you described as sort of a bump and that the phone cut off. I had told him the bump, it got to be his headset. His headset is always on his left ear. 
and he's a what, speaker. Yes, and, and what you said to Mr. Crump was, at that point, the phone cut off. Yes, I kept okay. several quick. Right, so once the phone cuts off, I had a call back. There's nothing else that you have to say, correct? Because once the phone cuts off, you certainly can't hear anything else that might have been said because the phone had been disconnected. Yes, sir. So you told Mr. Crump that the phone cut off. Yes, sir. So, if you say at the point where there was this exchange, the, com the conversation, the exchange, and the bump, and the phone cut off, doesn't that leave the impression that there was nothing else you could hear after that? Yes, sir. And you didn't at that point say, oh, by the way, no, I heard more after that actually. They asked me more, sir. The state had asked me more, sir. Well, are you saying then that when you told Mr. Crump that after you heard the bump and the phone cut off, that you decided not to tell him that after the bump, but before the phone cut off, you heard Trayvon Martin say a little get off, get off? Do you understand the question? Yes, ma'am. You may answer. Like I told you from the beginning, that interview, I think it lasts like 13 minutes. I don't know. But it didn't last for that long. So I had to rush on it because I really did not want to be on the phone, sir. So I did not take my time at just like I. I took my time. I had more time when I was talking to the state. Well, Crump, no. So the question is no. So of all of the things that you thought might be important for them to know about what you knew, I had told you. You decided not to say that before the phone shut off, you heard Trayvon Martin say, a little get off, get off. Objection asked and answered. Okay, let's have it answered one more time and then move on. May we approach the bench, please? No, she can answer the question. Go ahead and answer. Yes, sir. So you made the decision then not to tell Mr. Crump that you'd actually heard Trayvon Martin say, get off, get off, because you were in a hurry? Objection asked and answered. So the word in a hurry is an additional part to that question, so I will allow it you may answer. Yes, sir. Because Crump is not among the forces. So you weren't worried about telling him, first of all, the truth He's or not, the whole story? First of all, Crump is not law enforcement. He's not an officer. I knew that he was not an officer. So like I told the mother from the beginning, if officer wants to talk to me, know the exact story, everything about what happened that night, they will reach me at my number. You got it? If I got it, what I heard you to say is that you told Ms. Fulton that if they wanted to hear everything, that an officer, that you would tell everything to an officer? Yes, sir. But they didn't put an officer in contact with you? I don't know about that, sir. Well, you know you didn't get any messages or get any calls from an officer. No, no sir. So when you were then talking with Mr. Crump in this recorded interview, for the first time ever being asked to tell the story about what you knew. You were in a hurry, and among the things that you chose not to say was that before the phone cut off, but after the bump, you heard Trayvon Martin say, a little get off, get off. Question asked and answered. This will be the last time the question will be asked and, and answered. You may answer. 
Yes, sir. So let's move then to the April 2nd interview where you did have a chance to tell Mr. Delarianda everything. Yes, sir. And that was your purpose? Yes, sir. This was the interview by law enforcement that you'd been waiting for? Yes, sir. That you knew was coming? Yes, sir. And that you were ready to tell everything just like it was? Yes, sir. Even if that was different than what you'd said before? I never thought that the mother, the interview would be with in the mother house, with the mother. mother. <coughs> Have you had a chance to read the transcript of your interview with Mr. De La Rionda on uh, April 2nd, 2012? <coughs> Not only. When's the last time you had a chance to look at it? <coughs> Two weeks ago. Pardon me? Two weeks ago. When and where did that happen? FDLE. I, I can't hear you. Can you speak up just enough? I said FDLE. L E. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Yes, sir. Two, two weeks ago at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, you had a chance to review the transcript of the interview you gave with Mr. De La Rionda? No, listen to it. I had a chance to listen to it. Oh, so you, you had a chance to listen to the recording? Yes, sir. This was at the FDLE in Miami? Yes, sir. And who was present, if anyone, from the state attorney's office? No, sir. Two detectives. Two F FDLE detectives. Do you remember the date that this took place? No, sir. A couple of weeks ago, though, you went to FDLE in Miami, and they gave you a chance to review the statement? Yes, sir. And and did you? Yes, sir. Did you review any other statements at that time? The in, the interview I had with you. I watched the interview that I had with you. That would be a videotaped deposition? Yes, sir. Did you have a chance or did you review any other material in anticipation of coming to court? No, sir. Did you review the transcript or listen to the recordings made by Mr. Crum? No, sir. So let's talk a little bit about the interview on, March, on April 2nd, 2012. But I know that you talked about, in this case already, and that you talk about in that interview, the idea that the phone kept hanging up that day. Yes, sir. So in other words, you and Trayvon Martin would be talking, and for no apparent reason, the call would be lost. Yes, sir. Not because you hung up, correct? No, sir. Or because that you know of. Bad opposite. signal. Pardon me? Bad signal. So you were plagued with bad, a bad signal all day? Yes, sir. 
and you really never knew when the phone was going to disconnect. No, sir. And usually what would happen is that when the phone disconnected, one or the other of, of you would call each other back. Yes, sir. So throughout the course of the day, you wound up actually speaking with each other several hours. Yes, sir. What you remember about this case, though, and the phone disconnecting was that there were points in time within the conversation after George Zimmerman saw Trayvon Martin and began watching him that the phone hung up and that you dialed Mr. Martin back or that he dialed you back. Yes, sir. And then there were points in time where you would remember what was happening after the call was reconnected. Yes, sir. It's your recollection that while at the mailbox, that's when the phone hung up at least once? Yes, sir. And before that, after Mr. Uh, Zimmerman was keeping his eye on uh, Trayvon Martin, do you remember the phone hanging up and having to reconnect? Yes, sir. As he began, began walking back home to try to lose the Georgian George. First, before you get to that, be, we were using this, um, this point where Trayvon Martin says to you that Mr. Zimmerman is watching him. So from that point, you've said the phone did cut off a couple of times um, after that, but think this first. Before that point, do you remember talking to uh, Trayvon Martin after he entered the complex and having the phone disconnect? Yes, sir. Where was he and, and um, when in the conversation did that take place? The Mella area. The Mella area. The only time you remember the phone disconnecting um, prior to learning from Mr. Martin that George Zimmerman was keeping his eye on him was, well, what you believe to be when Mr. Martin was at the mail area. Yes, sir. And after that, so after Mr. Martin left the mail area, as best as you know, and began walking towards um, where his, where, where Trayvon was staying. Yes, sir. Did the phone cut off again? Yes, sir. And then did you call him back? Yes, sir. And then after you called him back, that was, in fact, the last call of the evening between you and Mr. Martin. Yes, sir. That's the call that you cut off. Yes, sir. The call that you lost or that was disconnected before the last call was when Mr. Martin was walking, was walking, walking toward where he was staying. Yes, sir. And he was, he had told you at that point that the man was in the car. Yes, sir. The man was on the phone. Yes, sir. And that he was, had decided to go ahead and go on home. Yes, sir. And you told him to do that, right? Yes, sir. In fact, you told him to run. Yes, sir. And as far as you know, he did. Yes, sir. Yes. And at the point that he ran, Mr. Zimmerman was still in the car. I don't know about that, sir. Because he told me the man started following him, sir. Well, let's, piece, let's break it down step by step. At the point that you told Trayvon Martin to run, your understanding from piecing it all together was that Trayvon Martin was headed towards the back of where his father was staying. He's going to run. Run from the back, yeah. which means to go in the back of the house as opposed to the front. Yes, to try to lose the man who was following him. Gotcha. So at that point, when he was walking and decided to go on home, yes, that sir. Mr. Zimmerman was still in the car. Still following him, sir. In the car. Yes, sir. And that Mr. Zimmerman was on the phone. 
I know about the phone, sir. I thought you said that Trayvon Martin That's told you he was this guy's. Him. That's when he was watching him. Trayvon had told me the manager's on the phone watching him. <clears throat> so Trayvon Martin had told you that when he noticed the man watching him, that the man was in a car and that the man was on the phone. And you just watch him, yes sir. Exactly, exactly. Yes sir. And that he started walking in the direction of his home. Yes sir. And that the man followed him. Yes sir. And Kept at that following. Yes, in the car. Yes sir. And that you had a conversation with Mr. Martin where you told him, well, just run on home. Yes, sir. And as far as you know, he did, correct? No, sir. He had me, he, he, I told him run home. And then he said, no, no, no is no. And then a second later, he come and tell me he's gonna make a run from the back area where his father, fiance, lives. Let, let's, break that down just a little bit so at the point at the point that he says the man's following me yes he was trying to lose the man let's let's break it down this way mr martin leaves what you think is the mail area and yes, walks sir. in the direction of where he stayed yes, sir yes yes sir and at that point, Mr. Zimmerman was still in his vehicle. Yes, sir. And Mr. Martin continued to walk. Yes, sir. And he observed and told you that the man's following him in the car. Yes, sir. And then you said, well, run. Yes, sir. And he did run. From the back area to church. Well, he wasn't in the, he was on the street or on the sidewalk in front of Mr. Zimmerman's car at the point that he decided to run. Yes, sir. And he ran. Yes, correct? sir, from the back area to try to lose him. You don't know whether he ran in a direction where you could only travel by foot or whether you could drive. No, sir. I don't live in that area. Agreed. No. What you knew at that point, though, was that Mr. Zimmerman was still in his vehicle, probably still on the phone, because Trayvon Martin never said he wasn't. Okay. And there's a witness to speculate as to what Mr. Zimmerman was doing or not regarding the phone. So, say and rephrase the question, please. Mr. Martin never said he wasn't on the phone. The only time that Trayvon told me the man was on the phone when he was at the Mellon area, that's the only time. I never knew about the, he was still on the phone. I never knew about that. He never told me about that. Right, so. He just told me the man started following him. And that he was on the phone and he never told you that he wasn't on the phone. No. But he was still in the car. Yeah. And yes, the, sir. And then, then that you said, we'll run. And he ran. Correct? Yeah, from the back area. To the That's what's confusing me. When you say ran from the back, are you saying that at the point that he decided to run, yes. that he decided to run from where he was to the back of where he was staying? Yes. And you don't know what direction he took to, to head that way? No, sir. Because you don't know where he was at the point that he decided to run? No, sir. But you do know that he ran. Yes, sir. And you could tell because you could hear the wind. Yes, sir. And then the phone cut off. <coughs> yes, sir. I think, yes. Yes, sir. So at that point, you knew that he was running. Yes, sir. When I called back. When I called back. Right. Well, let me take it a little slower. So at the point that he ran, you knew he was running. Yes, sir. You didn't know if he was running around on the street or sidewalk where Mr. Zimmerman could continue to follow him in the vehicle or whether he ran 
through a cut through or something where no vehicles. Well, it would be speculation if, if she, you have to ask her what she knows, what she thinks somebody else may have been doing. Yes, of course. What I'm focusing on was at the point that Trayvon Martin ran. You have that point pretty clear in your mind, correct? Yes, sir. You don't know whether he ran on around on the street that he'd been walking on no, or whether sir. he ran through a part of the community where you can't drive. No, sir, I had told you when he ran the phone lost contact it all so I had to call back again. So at the point yes, that he ran, the phone cut off. Yes, sir. And then you called back. Yes, sir. And how long was it in between you losing the connection and you calling back? I don't know, sir. Well, do you think the phone was shut off by somebody? You didn't hang up, right? No, sir. And you have no reason to think that Trayvon Martin hung up? No, sir. So it seemed to you like what had been happening all day that for no apparent reason, maybe bad signal, the, the call was lost. Yes, sir. So you talked with him then again. Was that a minute, two minutes, five seconds? Do you have any sense of after he ran, when it was that you talked with uh, Trayvon Martin again? I don't understand what you, what's your question. If I might have a moment. Let me show you defendants 16. It's that call chart that we talked about yesterday. Yes, sir. Go ahead and take a minute and look at it. Yesterday, you said that as far as you knew, those were accurate times of the calls that you and Trayvon Martin had on February 26th, correct? Yes, sir because it was represented to you that those times were taken from the actual phone company records. Yes, sir. So you don't have any argument with that? No, sir. Well, take a look at the second to last call. Yes, sir. It began at 6.54.16 p.m. Yes, and disconnected at 7.11. 47. You see that? Yes, sir. The next call picked up at 7.12.06. You see that? Yes, sir. And disconnected at 7.15.43. Correct? Yes, sir. So let's work backwards. Let's assume that at 7.15.43, the phone cut off when yes. you were describing the interaction between Mr. Martin and Mr. Zimmerman. Yes, okay? sir. So that call had started at 7.12.06, which was a little over three minutes, correct? Yes, sir. And there weren't any interruptions in that phone call? No, sir. And frankly, you don't know at 7.15.43 when the phone cut off, whether it cut off for any reason other then it was just one more lost call. No, sir. So look at the other call, though, the one before it, where it says it disconnected at a 7 11 47. Do you yes. see that? Yes, sir. And that the next call started at 7 12 06. Yes, sir. If you do the math and figure out how long it was between 7 11 47 and 7 12 06, to me, that is. Can you please keep your. If you need to take a copy of that. Of course. I'll step back. That's about 19 seconds, correct? Yes, sir. So, does that seem to you to be about right? That when Trayvon Martin ran, ran towards the back of his father's house, while George Zimmerman was in the car, that about 20 seconds elapsed before your call reconnected. 
Yes, sir. So the only time from before 7 o'clock, before any part of this case actually started, yes, sir. you were on the phone with Mr. Martin for all of that time except about 20 seconds. Yes, sir. And it was the 20 seconds we're talking about where Mr. Martin had decided to run and then you reconnected with him. Yes, sir. Would this be a good time for a short recess? You only do a brief recess, yes. Okay, we're gonna take a 15 minute recess. If you'll just remain seated, Ms. Gentile. Ladies and gentlemen, put your notepads face down on the chair and follow Deputy a Corporal Demps back to the jury room. Ms. Gentile, we're going to take a, you may be seated, we're going to take a 15 minute recess. You're going to be able to uh, leave the stand, but I'll remind you not to discuss your testimony with anybody while we're on recess. Uh, Corporal Lapp, if you'll please um, help Ms. Gentile out. Is there anything we need to take up before we take a 15 minute recess? Okay, thank you, Court. We'll be in recess for 15 minutes.